moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. Well, again, I've struggled with the best way to do this, uh, but let's just start in chapter 4, verse 1, and pick back up because, as we said, Paul's walked through all the theology of it. He makes the turn in chapter 4 where things get very practical. So when we get to uh, verse 4, make sure we can get this thing working now. Let me try to grab a hold of it again. If not, your, your heads are going to be down the whole time. Drop it and pick it back up, Tyler. Let me see if I can grab it or we're going to be for sure. For sure in trouble. And we may just have to sit down with you one at a time and you guys just spend it, be here all day, I guess. We can do that. You're going to load. No, it's not. All right. Look down at your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he starts with this thought. He, he brings this down to an example, well, not just an example, but the point of application of everything he's saying. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, there's one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Now, it's not hard to figure out what Paul wants to talk about. The subject uh, of everything that he wants to talk about is the body, which is another reference for the church. And when you look at this list that contains in verse 4, it contains the Spirit, it contains the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 5, it contains the God and Father, it contains the Trinity. But he wants to keep that in context with the body. That's what he's most concerned about is the body. And if you think about it from Paul's perspective, you've got Jews and Gentiles, two totally different people groups, that he's trying to get them to understand that God has made them one new man and now he wants to them to behave like that. Their experience needs to be unity. He's made them one. Now he wants their experience to be that same oneness. And obviously unity's on his mind. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's not hard to see what Paul wants to talk about. So the subject is the church. That's his heart. The experience of the church is unity, oneness, oneness, oneness. He hammers this out three times. And the basis for this unity is the Trinity, the Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Father. Now, like I said earlier before we got started, the Trinity is the basis for really everything in the Christian experience. It's the basis because it teaches us how to relate to one another in the church, as our families, and in marriages. And you need to be deeply concerned about relationships within the body just because that's where Paul starts. It's the body or the church for whom Christ died. Okay? You need to always understand that. Christ died for His bride, 
the church. And so that's where we start. But if you look where we're headed, look at chapter 5, verse 22. First word, wives. Ephesians 5, 25. First word, husbands. He's going to talk about the Trinity in relationship to your marriage. Then he's going to talk about Trinity in relationship to your family. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. You see, the Trinity is the basis for how we relate to one another as Christians. It's the basis for how we relate to one another within this body, within this people that God has made. It's the basis for how we relate to one another as a husband and a wife. And I know that may just blow your mind, but it really, it's very practical. It's very simple. How the Godhead relates to one another, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is exactly how you relate to one another as a husband and a wife. And the way that they relate as a Godhead is exactly how we relate to one another as parents and children. Now, that's a very foreign thought to you, but you've got to get busy because you need to teach your kids these things. As they grow mature, if you help them to understand the unity and the love within the Trinity and the design in which it has been, it hasn't been created, the design in which it always existed, they can understand how mom and dad properly relate to one another. And if you and as a husband and wife can look upon the glory of the Trinity and see the love and the unity and the order within the Trinity, then you'll better understand your marriage and how you relate to one another as a husband and a wife. God's got every bit of this rigged, right, Ms. Burma? Every bit of it's rigged. Every bit of it brings Him glory. And there's so much of creation that reflects His glory. There's so much of the design of creation that reflects the glory of the Gospel. And there's so much, needs to be, of your marriage relationship and of your family that reflects the wisdom and the glory of God and the Trinity. He's got all of these pictures of His glory woven into every part of our lives. And the more that we understand that, the more that we can, with that understanding, run in a way that pleases Him or walk worthy of, of, of our calling. So before I take you to the Trinity, though, I want to take you to an example that I think that you will better understand, and that's the example of marriage. I have this, and if it works, I'm in Matthew 19. But let's start with marriage, understand the picture in that relationship, then I'll show you the picture in the Trinity, okay? Okay. Because I think we can all understand mom and dad or husband and wife. You've had some sort of experience there, right? Now, in Matthew 19, some religious leaders come up to Jesus and they begin to ask him a question. And they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Now, I wish I had time to talk about verse 4, but he says, and he answered them, have you not read, meaning you always have to go back to the word of God. Have you not read... That he who created them from the beginning made them, made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, when we see these words, for instance, one flesh... You know, I always use this passage in the context of doing a wedding ceremony because it is a covenant. The Bible refers to the marriage as a covenant. And we hear the idea of being made one that is a little bit mystical or magical or maybe even unexplainable to us. But actually, it's very practical in the marriage relationship. You see, you have this idea of being two before marriage and then you are made into one in the marriage, okay? And this union, if you will, has been accomplished what God has joined. In other words, on a spiritual level, on a theological level, and by the way, marriage is first theological because it was created by God to glorify Him. In that institution that He created, He takes two that, have, or, that are separated and he unites them together and he forms them into one person, if you will. 
They don't lose their distinctness or their personalities and neither do we as a church. And I'll show you that in the weeks ahead. But in the marriage ceremony, through the covenant of marriage, two separate individuals are made one by God. Okay? Now, when we think about that in light of the gospel, the same thing takes place. You and I are separated from Christ and by the grace of God and the glory of God, the gospel is preached to us and through the workings of the Spirit, we're separated from God, but we're joined to God and we're made one with God and each other. It's the same picture. Now, you also know from the marriage, cere- uh, uh, from the marriage ceremony, God says this at the end of it. I forgot it's up here. Let, let no man separate. Now, when there's separation, it breaks the picture of the gospel. Because God didn't design it to be that way. And I know some of you have had to walk through that tragedy and it is an utter, absolute tragedy. But nonetheless, just look with me this morning at the glory of the gospel in this picture of marriage. God takes two and he makes them one. And then he very clearly says, no man shall separate this. Because in the gospel, when we're joined to God, we can't be separated because God is faithful. Even in spite of our unfaithfulness, the Lord Jesus Christ is faithful to His bride and He shall never separate from His bride. He holds that covenant together. Now, we add this and we get it from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 39. We always say this, until what do you part? Until death do you part. The reason being is the gospel supersedes or goes way beyond the marriage covenant. The gospel covenant is the covenant. That's the one that God wants us to see through marriage. And so when a spouse dies, that covenant is automatically broken because we enter into the glory of God. And there's no more union that are unique other than the singular union of being made one with God through Christ. There's not going to be husbands and wives in heaven. You had your season or your time of painting the picture of the gospel. Then you die and you enter into glory. And the oneness that we enjoy with the Lord Jesus Christ will fully and finally satisfy us forever and will all be one in Him. And that's why we say, until death do you part. Because at the point of death, again, the marriage covenant is broken and we enjoy the covenant of grace with our relationship with God. And there's all kinds of things that are in life that paint this picture, but nothing so beautifully paints it as the marriage covenant. Now, this will help you understand it. The wedding ceremony is theological. Then you go home. I made you one at the wedding ceremony, or or rather God made you one at the wedding ceremony. But then you go home. And you have to practically work out the unity that's already been made. And please don't think that the unity is made by the state of Alabama. The unity is made by God. And then you get home and you have to work that out and you realize how hard it is to walk in what's already been done. You might enjoy it for the first week, the honeymoon, Or maybe you got lucky and went six weeks enjoying the unity of the marriage relationship. Or maybe a year. I have some that broke down on the honeymoon and the unity fell all apart. But we know that there's that honeymoon season, so to speak, that you enjoy the oneness and the unity and you're just filled with love and joy. But then you soon realize that this is going to take a lot of work. And then unfortunately, you've got two people that have to understand this is going to take a lot of work. I'm going to have to, oh, what was those words? With all humility and meekness and patience, bearing up one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We could use the same words. You see, all of a sudden you've got two individuals that's got to work very diligently at walking at what they already are. And all of us can understand, man, that's just, that's really hard. In fact, you know, Paige and I think about um, Audrey getting married one day and we just want to shout, no, 
Wait till you're like 40 and maybe you'll understand marriage. <laughs> you know, because Paige and I are just now coming to the place in our lives where we understand the glory of the gospel in marriage and the theological perspectives and all that's involved. And we have so much that we've got to teach all these kids running around here so that they can understand that marriage is first and foremost theological, God glorifying before they ever enter into it so they can understand the difficulties that they're going to face as they walk through it. Now, that's the picture of marriage. Two has been made one. God has joined them together. It comes with the warning because man now has handed this covenant and he doesn't take it as seriously as God, but he warns us, let no man separate. And then he gives us until death do you part. In the gospel, the ending is not the same, but the beginning is identical. Just like in Ephesians 2, we were dead and we were separated and God's grace comes to us. And He unites us to God through His work on Calvary. We are made one with God. And there is no warning, let no man separate. In fact, there are the passages in John 10 that says, no one can take you out of His hand, the Lord Jesus. And then the Father comes along and places His hand around the hand of the Lord Jesus and says, no one can take you out of My hand. Meaning this covenant will never be broken because I made it, I ratified it, you are secure. If you're in Christ this morning, your marriage will last for all eternity. You're married to the Lamb of God. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Even in our unfaithfulness and sin, our husband holds us so dear and loves us so much for all of eternity. He will not let you go. Nor will He leave you in your sin. But He will discipline you. And He will correct you. And He will change you from the inside out in order for you to walk worthy of the One who has called you into this relationship. So we have this beautiful picture in marriage of the gospel. And we've walked through all of these wonderful words and phrases. We're a new man. We have a new identity. We're a one new body now. We live in a new community of people. In, in chapter 2, 19, he referred to us as fellow citizens. We have a new nationality. We belong to a different country now. In chapter 2, 21 and 22, 20, verses 21 and 22, he talks about us being fitted together and built together. In other words, worship has changed. No longer do we worship at different places, but we rather worship as a people because Emmanuel, God, is with us. You see, everything's different for us now. Everything's changed through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what's happened, if you will, in the ceremony of chapter 2. And then we get to chapter 3, verses 14. And Paul now wants to make this a practical part of our lives. And so he does everything that he knows to do. The first thing that he does is he prays because he knows for us to know how to live together in this church, something's got to happen in our hearts. So he prays that the power of God through the working of the Holy Spirit would happen so that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. In other words, Paul's like, God, I know the ceremony's taking place in chapter 2 through the gospel, but now we've got to work this thing out practically. And so, Father, I'm praying that you would do a work on their hearts so it will be much easier for them to practically work these things out. That's chapter 3, or the end of chapter 3, 14 through 21. When you get to chapter 4, verse 1, then we have the first exhortation of the book and he tells us about the attitude that we need to have in our hearts. We need to make ourselves of no reputation. That's all humility. We need to exercise meekness or gentleness toward one another. We need to be long-suffering in our love or patience toward one another. We need to bear up one another or show tolerance for one another in love. Why? In order for us to be radically diligent to preserve what's already been done, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So he talks about attitudes, heart attitudes. And then he comes down to the example that I use marriage, but Paul's going to use, once again, the Trinity. So this morning in just a few minutes, let's walk through these phrases and hopefully uh, in this short time you will be able to grasp uh, some of the truths here. But if you'll notice, it helps us to understand this. 
um, when you see this really in somewhat of triplets. Let me read verses 4, 5, and 6. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling. So around the Spirit of God, he lays out three things. Okay? One, one, and one. Then he comes down to the Lord. There's one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of which we have one faith and one baptism. And I'll explain all these. And then he comes down. There's one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Now, when we look at this, please bear with me. If you don't understand something, just reflect back to the marriage real quickly. And then you can come back into this. And I think that you'll see it fine. Because like I said when I started... If I told you this morning that I was going to preach on the marriage relationship, you would be intensely involved because all of us struggle quite a bit in the marriage relationship from time to time. It's a struggle. But you need to understand the primary concern is the church. And I wish that everybody involved in the church were Deeply concerned to the point of losing sleep when we have division in the church. When I walked into this church six years ago, there was division across the room. And it was uncomfortable to be in and it was horrible to preach in. I don't sense that now. And I'm very thankful for that. But we always need to be wary of that because it is a miserable experience. Imagine you having two kids that are kind of at that age where they're adults, and, but you're still kind of feeding into their lives. And then all of a sudden, brother and sister won't even talk anymore, have anything to do with one another anymore, just completely separated themselves from one another. How would that affect you as a mom and a dad? It would crush you. And yet we seem to be so comfortable in the family of God when there's a division. We can't be that way. Because there's just one body. And we need to be diligent in protecting and preserving the unity that the Spirit of God has established within the body. And when we talk about one body, you need to understand he's not, in Paul's mind, he's not talking about Corinth Baptist Church or the local body. He's talking about the universal church. We used to call it Catholic Church, which the word Catholic actually means universal. There's one Catholic Church, but then the Catholics left behind the Word of God and put a man over in place of God, and now they're just a heresy. So we, we changed it to one universal church, but today's time, the word universal means something. Millions of people belong to universalism, which means there's many roads to God everybody's going. I don't know what word we'll pick now, but Paul's idea is the church here, not just the church here. Because God's church transcends denominations. In fact, in Galatians 3, it transcends every division. He'll say in Galatians 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. There's just one church. And God did not subscribe any denomination to that church. We did that. And when we get to heaven, all of that will be removed, praise God. Amen. All of that division will be taken away. And we need to remember that sometimes. There's believers everywhere. There may even be a few believers among Baptists. Maybe. Maybe. But there's believers everywhere. But they hold on to the one faith that I will talk about in just a minute. Don't Please don't think that I'm being universalist and saying there's believers in um, the Mormon church or there's believers in Jehovah's Witness church. Well, if there are, they'll be coming out quickly because they'll see it for what it is and come out. But there's one body that has been united by one spirit or the third person of the Trinity. It is this spirit... Right here, the one Spirit that draws people to the Father. There is one Spirit that seals people to Christ. And think of it this way. What the Father has planned from all eternity, the Son accomplished on Calvary. And now the Spirit's job is to apply all these wonderful things to our lives. It is the Spirit that makes us one with one another and one with God through the Gospel. 
That's His job. There is no two spirits at work. And the spirit must be at work. Yesterday at work, I had a guy come in that I went to church with him at Center Point years ago. And I was actually um, the one probably teaching Awana at the time to his child. And his child made a profession of faith at six years old. And then I'd had several conversations with him later. There was no fruit. Uh, he was distraught with his son. Um, he said language was horrendous, but now he was a grown man. And he's like, I was struggling to figure out how to handle these things. And he said, he came in the store yesterday crying. He wanted to tell me. He said, my son called me yesterday and said, Dad, are you sitting down? And my first thought was, oh, no, what's happened? And he said, okay, I'm sitting down, son. What is it? And he said, through his tears, he said, son, I know. He said, Dad, I know that you always thought I knew the Lord. But he said, I want you to know now I know the Lord. He has saved me and I'm a different man. And he was just rejoicing in that. And we need to constantly remind ourselves that it is the spirit that draws people to salvation. It's not men. God uses men some ways, but most time men get carried away with their words and with their analogies and with their stories and various things. And God may or may not work in those situations, but at the end of the day, Everyone that's in heaven will be there because they have been born of the Spirit of God. Everyone that is there will have been drawn and will have been sanctified or set apart unto God by the work of the Spirit and by no other work. It is His work alone. And that Spirit gives us, if you will, that calling. The calling comes from the Spirit of God and not from men. And through that calling, we experience this one hope that you and I have. This one hope that Jew and Gentile alike, all who are saved, this one eager expectation and realization that we'll enjoy God forever. And according to Scripture, not all men are called. But in Romans 8, it says those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be firstborn among his brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he will glorify. That's that special calling of God that comes from the spirit. So all these things relate to the spirit of God. Then he talks about there is one Lord. There's one Savior, Jesus Christ, who is both fully man and fully God. A couple of passages, 1 Timothy 2, there's one God, there's one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. John 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. There's only one Savior. There's not a Savior that goes by a different name in Myanmar. There's not a Savior in Thailand that goes by a different name. There's one Savior that has been named among men, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. And if you're ever in the presence of God and received, it will be because of that one mediator that stood in your place on the cross when He died and paid for your sins. There's one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then talks about through this, where there's one faith and there's one baptism. Now, these two are very difficult, and I greatly wish I had more time because it's, it's difficult to understand what exactly he's referring to. Is faith what he's referring to is that which I express in the Lord? And absolutely, that could be. There's only one way to have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's simply faith and faith alone or trust and trust alone. There's only one faith. But he also could be talking about the body of faith, the faith, the the doctrines that make up our faith. That is what we believe. Paul could be talking about there's one faith, i.e. that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again. There's one faith. There's only one savior or mediator for men. There's only one faith who is fully God and fully man. There's only one faith. And the only way to come to God is to come through the work of the cross. In other words, we have unity in the universal church. But unity or truth cannot be sacrificed for that unity. 
We don't look the other way when people don't consider Jesus to be also fully God. We don't have union with those people. We don't look the other way when the Catholic Church says that the way to heaven is to follow a system of works. We don't have union. Even though they call themselves Christians, that's not the faith that you and I proclaim. It's through grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what we proclaim. So Paul may very well be talking about the doctrines that he laid out in Romans and Ephesians. There's only one faith. And those things, believe it or not, change over time. Because that faith continues to be challenged and we continually have to go back to the Word of God and go, no, what you're saying is wrong. Have you not read? And so we begin to understand these things. that There's only one system of doctrines by which we come to God and that is the faith. Something equally confusing is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, is Paul talking about water baptism here? Is he talking about the baptism of the Spirit? Because if you look in uh, John the Baptist's teaching, every time he talks about baptism, John's talking about a spiritual baptism. If you go to the book of Acts and look at the word baptism, almost every time it's talking about water baptism. So is he saying that there's only one way to be baptized in there or there's only one way to be baptized spiritually? Well, for Paul, I'll tell you what I discern from Scripture. For Paul, it's both. You see, you and I like to put things in theological boxes and we like to get everything arranged in our box. Paul doesn't separate things. Paul has a tendency to put everything in the same box and leave you to think. Yes, there's only one baptism. And if you're not baptized by the Spirit of God or immersed by the Spirit of God, you're not saved. But that baptism by the Spirit of God is expressed when we walk through the waters of baptism. The most important thing for the Apostle Paul, we would really translate the word union. There's only one union, and that union is with Jesus Christ. And that union is expressed when the Spirit of God changes us and awakens us from the dead. And that union is expressed when we go through the waters of baptism. It's funny how, you know, Baptists, in my mind, have erred just as much as most other denominations we're so concerned about baptism of believers that we've, we've separated the expression of faith and baptism. We've talked about this before. In the text, the call was repent and be baptized. No, we don't do that anymore. We want you to be led in a prayer. We want you to express that faith by coming down front at the funeral the other day. Just no one looking around. Just lift your head and, and look at me. And then he, he, he uh, what's it called? He, he expressed that they had trusted Jesus with that look. And you know, they may or may not have. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's bizarre how we communicate that expression of faith today. I know I don't have the waters always full and, and, and warm for you. But to come to faith in Christ in the early church was turn from your sins and come be baptized. Did that make the Spirit of God work? No. Just turning from your sins and coming forth by faith was that expression that God had already changed your heart. Whatever Paul's talking about here, there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, and there's only one union or one baptism. And then he concludes with this thought as we will as well. He winds it up with God. There's only one God and Father who is over all, He's through all, and He's in all in reference to the body of Christ. It is God the Father who gets all the glory. It is God the Father who is sovereign over us. It is God the Father that is working through us. And it is God the Father who works in us through His Spirit. There's only one God and Father. Now it's sad to read, and I'm pretty sure about this and you guys correct me if I'm not the president of the SBC right now what was his name I forget at the moment oh, the young guy J.D. Greer reference that we worship the same God as the Muslims broke my heart no we don't no we don't there's only one God and Father and he has a son and his name is Jesus Christ we're not confused about names, okay? 
The God who created the heavens and the earth is the God who through by grace from the very first chapters of the Bible began to work out the salvation of his men in creation. And it is this God and Father whose spirit works among us and in us and through us. They don't go by different names. Let's pray.